Okay, hello everyone. It's uh, now 12 o'clock. We'll get started. Welcome to today's Lunch and Learn webinar on updates in pharmacotherapy. Today's faculty presenter is Alexandra Andrick. If you are interested in obtaining a letter of completion for today's webinar, the following requirements must be submitted. So number one, you must complete the online registration form for the webinar. Number two, you must view the full hour of the live webinar session. You must log in using your first and last name so that we could track your participation. If you are viewing the webinar today as a group, please be sure to email me with a list of your names and email addresses by end of day today, and my email address is on the top right-hand side of the screen. And lastly, you must complete the online evaluation form following the webinar, which will be emailed out to everyone. These webinars are being tweeted live through Twitter. Follow the CAMH Nicotine Dependent Services on Twitter at PS Quit Smoking. To follow the live tweeting or to post your questions or comments using Twitter, follow hashtag TeachWebinar. So again, today's faculty presenter is Alexandra Antrick. Alexandra is a registered nurse who has worked at the Center for Addiction and Mental Health since 2006. Alexandra has worked in a variety of mental health and addiction settings, such as the General Psychiatry Program and the Addiction Medicine Service. As a registered nurse in the Nicotine Dependent Service, she monitors clients' responses to cessation medications and prescribes nicotine replacement therapy. Alexandra also provides smoking cessation counseling and co-facilitates therapeutic groups. Lastly, she has co-facilitated presentations for healthcare professionals regarding smoking cessation, reduction, and group counseling. These are our disclosures. No disclosures for Alexandra. And the TEACH curriculum and slides were developed and compiled with funding from the Government of Ontario, Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care. Content of the slides were primarily based on evidence-based guidelines, including the following three sources. Development and delivery of the TEACH curriculum is not influenced or funded in any part by the tobacco industry, nor the pharmaceutical industry. Disclaimer. And before we begin today, we have a few polling questions that we'd act, uh, like to ask the group. Now, these questions were in the registration form, but we'd like to put them to the, the webinar today just so that everyone has an idea of the variety of group here. So if you could please submit your responses. Okay, great. So a variety of responses here. It seems that the bulk of you are either pharmacists or respiratory therapists. Okay. Okay, and the next question is asking what region you are from. Okay, great. So the majority of you are from the GTA. And then the last question is the type of organization you work for. Okay, majority of you from hospital. Great, so thank you everyone for participating in the polls. I'm going to hand it over to Alex now. Thank you for taking time out of your day to um, be engaged in this webinar. 
I just want to let everybody know that I will be answering questions at, um, I'm going to speak till about 1245. And I also want to let everybody know that if there's any questions that I'm unable to get to today, I will get those answered for you. So rest assured, please feel free to ask anything you like. And I'm, I'm very glad to hear that um, uh, we have a lot of pharmacists attending the webinar, respiratory therapists, and uh, other members of the team that um, work with clients to help them reach their goals. So let's begin. All right, so the first thing we're going to talk about is the algorithm for helping people make a change in their tobacco use. So I'm sure everyone knows about the 5A. So I'm going to quickly go over some key points within this algorithm, um, maybe highlight some important things that can be helpful in assisting clients making any sort of change, whether it be a reduction towards the quit, uh, quitting, or getting that conversation going. So when we think about asking clients about their tobacco use, we want to have that non-judgmental approach and we want to ask an open-ended question. So please tell me about your tobacco use over the last six months. Could be an example besides the one that we have here on the screen. By asking that open-ended question, people are going to be able to give you uh, a lot more information. Maybe we're going to hear about uh, how smoking fits in their day, maybe some of their triggers, maybe their past quit attempts, and probably how much, uh, how many cigarettes they're smoking, and or if they're using maybe chew tobacco. The next step we want to do is we want to advise people. So when we're advising individuals, once again, we want to take that non-judgmental, uh, empathetic approach. Um, and we also want to be aware of what kind of other factors could be driving the use of tobacco. So, for instance, people may be uh, dealing with a significant loss in their life. Maybe they have a lot of conflict in their interpersonal relationships. Um, maybe they are smoking a lot because because of their withdrawal symptoms are very, very intense. And to not have that cigarette is so uncomfortable for them. So we really want to keep that in mind when, when we're advising clients to make that change. We also want to honor their autonomy, and we want to keep the door open. So when I say that, if I want to advise, I sort of want to ask permission. So I might want to say, you know, John, I'm wondering if it would be OK if I ask you about whether you would like to make a change in your tobacco use. By doing so, you're leaving that door open. It's non-confrontational, and people will maybe feel more comfortable and at ease to, to answer that question. As we look forward in the algorithm, we can see that if someone answers yes, we're going to assess their readiness to quit. So we're going to use those uh, confidence or readiness rulers. We want to ask about importance, and we want to ask about confidence. So when we see that importance is high and confidence is high, we can go to the assisting area. When we see the scores are lower, we're going to go to our uh, motivational interviewing techniques. Another thing I want to talk about when using the, the rulers or the scales is you want to ask people what that score means to them. So for instance, if I say, you know, I'm about a 5 out of 10 in importance in making a change in my tobacco. And that's, you know, if I think about all the other things I need to work on in my life, I'm about a 5 out of 10. And we want to actually pose the question in that way. You know, with all the things that are going on right now for you, how, is it, how important is it for you to make this change? So let's say I say a 5 out of 10. It would be really helpful if the clinician would then ask, well, tell me why you're not at a 0. And by doing so, the person themselves, or myself in this instance, will make 
maybe think about, hey, well, you know, I've got this cough. I really don't like how I'm spitting up this phlegm in the morning. And, you know, I kind of don't want to be spending my money on this anymore. And so I'm kind of hearing myself convince myself about some of the reasons why I might want to make a change. So we can also do this with the confidence rulers as well. And so let's say I say my confidence is a, a 3 out of 10. So if, once again, it's important for, for the question to be asked about, well, why aren't you at a 0? But I also want to ask, well, what would get you to a 4 out of 10? What's a little step that you could take? So these can be very helpful in, in your interactions with clients because you'll, you'll get to learn more about them. And in your next interaction, if they're open to you speaking about their tobacco use again, you'll have some, some information to work off of. And that's also because you're charting this information. So let's go to the desire to quit, so that idea of importance in making that change in confidence is less than 5 out of 10. What we can do as clinicians is we can look at the five R's. So we see here relevance, rewards, risks, roadblocks, and repetition. And sometimes we can, we can um, also, once again, write in the chart where someone is at, so the next person along the line, or yourself, if that would be you, can kind of pick up from where you left off the last time. So relevance. When we talk about relevance, we really want to cater our feedback to what's going on with the client. So are they experiencing any negative consequences uh, about their use? And let's say there's no negative consequences, they don't want to make that change, we can still pose that question of, would it be OK if I ask you about this on your next, next visit as well, if people aren't interested in opening up that conversation or, or talking a little bit about their tobacco use. So once again, relevance for looking at kind of what is some personalized feedback for the person that would be meaningful? So, you know, are they having problems breathing? Are they having uh, problems with their finances? Are they kind of sick of the enslavement to the cigarette? Um, does smoking interfere with their desire to be a good role model, role model for their child or their grandchild? So kind of listening to the client and figuring out what you can reflect back to them that will be meaningful. When we look at rewards, we're really looking at what are the good parts about the tobacco use. So, you know, I'm really trying to understand, you know, how smoking fits in your life, Mary. Could you let me know what are the, some of the good things uh, that you get from smoking or what kind of needs it's meeting? And so from there, people are going to feel more comfortable to talk about their use because it's like, hey, this clinician is trying to get an understanding about me and figure out kind of where I'm at. After exploring the rewards, we want to look at the risks. So hey, I really appreciate your honesty in telling me about your tobacco use, the kind of good things you get out of smoking. How about if we now check out some of the things that aren't so good about your tobacco use? So once again, we're looking at gaining more information from the client that we can use in our interactions and through our reflections. Because depending on what we reflect back, if we hear anything that could spur someone to make a change, it's going to come up in these conversations. And when we look at roadblocks, it's really about investigating, hey, what, what's standing in your way, John, of, of making this change? Or what do you see that could come up that could maybe uh, make it more difficult for you? So if we go back now to the assist area, we can see that we've got cold turkey, reducing to a quit, pharmacotherapy and counseling. And if and 
once again, if none of these interventions work, we're going back to assessing. So when we look at cold turkey, for a lot of people, actually, I'll just take a step back, a lot of people uh, can quit cold turkey and have done so in the past. With me saying this, I also think about how many people know about uh, smoking cessation programs, how many people have access to affordable smoking cessation medications. So we also want to consider this as well. At the same time, we want to provide a menu of options for clients. So if I'm seeing a client and a client says, Alex, you know, I kind of want to try this out on my own and see how it plays out. And so I want to honor that client's autonomy. I may want to ask permission to talk about the other options because I want to provide that menu of options. And then also say, in the end, it's up to you, Mary, what you would like to do. Um, could we continue to have our follow-ups? And then, you know, if you need tweaking in your plan, we can go that route. Okay, so when we look at um, pharmacotherapy, we're basically looking at advising the use of pharmacotherapy in clients who are smoking more than 10 cigarettes per day. And when we look at the research, we have a lot of research saying that nicotine replacement therapy is not that effective for people who are smoking less than 10 cigarettes. That being said, there may be some instances when we may provide maybe a short-acting uh, nicotine replacement therapy, patch, gum, inhaler, lozenge, uh, spray, um, if it could help someone. Because at least they'll be getting that um, nicotine in a cleaner, safer form. Another example where I might consider something like this would be, let's say a client first initial visit at our information session, they're smoking 20 cigarettes a day, and they've gotten rid of their uh, easy cigarettes. And, and these last 10 or, or 9 are very, very difficult to let go of. This could be another consideration. But once again, you want to have a, a conversation with the client and, and have further assessment to see if it would be beneficial for the person to use the nicotine replacement therapy when they're um, smoking less than those 10 cigarettes a day. So when we look at nicotine replacement therapy, pretty much there aren't really any uh, contraindications. Uh, there may be some cautions in terms of, of use. So because you have a lot of this information here, I, I think I'll just highlight some important uh, components that sometimes are missed. And uh, I'd like to talk about the patch, how for some people wearing it overnight can cause uh, very vivid dreams, sleep disturbance, and also these dreams can be very disturbing. Also, I have had clients say to me they love those dreams. They really get a kick out of them. So we really want to inform clients that, you know, if there's someone who wake, wakes up in the middle of the night to have a cigarette, maybe they want to consider wearing the patch overnight. Um, if they're not someone like that, that maybe they, you know, they can have that decision because at least when they wake up, they'll still have a bit of that uh, nicotine going through their system. But if, if they're having negative effects wearing it overnight, that they could take the patch off an hour before bed. The other thing I want to talk about in terms of nicotine replacement therapy or the patch specifically is we also want to make sure to let people know to try their best to not smoke on the patches or, the, or, or using NRT. But if it does happen that they check how they're feeling. And what I mean when I say that is, do they feel dizzy? Are they experiencing heart palpitations? Are they sweating? Do they feel nauseous? Have they vomited? 
all these symptoms are too much nicotine and they need to discontinue the nicotine replacement therapy for two hours and then, and then follow up with the, per, the person prescribing the NRT. Also, I like to ask people to kind of be aware of, you know, while they're using the nicotine replacement therapy that they look at, you know, when they're having cravings, what are those cravings about? Because if I think about someone who's smoking maybe 50 cigarettes a day, they may need a higher amount of uh, nicotine replacement therapy than the 21 milligram patch because people will generally get between one and three milligrams of nicotine per cigarette. So technically, someone receiving uh, 21 milligrams and they're a 50-day uh, cigarette smoker may be hard for them to make that quit and they may be smoking on top of, of the patch. So I, I thought I'd just throw that out there. We also want to look at when you're drinking coffee, tea, soft drinks, or juice, you want to wait 15 minutes before you use the inhaler, the lozenge, the gum, or the spray, as well as 15 minutes after you use those short-acting products. And the reason why we want people to wait that 15 minutes is because it, those beverages, coffee, tea, soft drinks, juice, and um, pop, basically make your mouth more acidic, and so the nicotine won't be absorbed as well. The other thing I'd like to highlight is that whole idea of the uh, nicotine inhaler. They probably should have called it the puffer. Um, if people take deep hauls on that inhaler, they're not going to get that nicotine absorbed through their cheek. What's going to actually happen is they're just going to have a cough attack and it's going to be irritating to their throat. So really important to let people know to kind of puff on that inhaler, you know, thinking about if, they, if someone's ever smoked a cigar, how they just take a little bit of an inhale in, or if someone's drinking a thick milkshake, that they um, take little sips on that. And initially, when you first start your first cartridge in that uh, plastic adapter, that people may have to puff on it for about a minute or so till they feel it, a taste, a cooling sensation, or a tingling sensation. And we also want people to be aware of that as well, because once that feeling isn't there anymore, then they know to change to the other uh, cartridge. Last thing I want to say in terms of the nicotine replacement therapy, actually I'll say two more things. Um, people need to watch out for their caffeine intake when they quit smoking. So oftentimes people who smoke are, are drinking a lot of caffeine as well. And so when you're someone who smokes, you can actually take more caffeine in because the caffeine is metabolized out of your body faster. The tar in the cigarette makes this metabolism happen faster. It's through uh, an enzyme in your, uh, in your liver. At the same time, when people quit smoking, their liver function normalizes. They don't have that tar affecting that liver enzyme anymore. And so that that means that caffeine is metabolized at a more normal rate. So if there's someone who, drink, who drinks five cups of coffee a day, that could feel like 10 cups of coffee a day. So we really want to advise people to take a step back and watch their caffeine intake. At the same time, if I'm someone who, who drinks five cups of coffee a day, I don't want to cut that cold turkey because most likely I will have... Um, I'll feel uh, nic uh, sorry caffeine withdrawal. So slowly we want people to reduce there. The other thing I want to say is about um, the gum use. It's really important that people chew, chew, park. Maybe they're going to have to chew for a couple minutes before they're going to have the um, taste, tingle, or cooling sensation when they park the gum between their teeth and their uh, buccal mucosa, and 
we want to advise people about that proper way of chewing because if people chew all the time, they're not going to get that nicotine to their brain and it's just going to give them a stomach ache and possibly the hiccups. So I'll kind of leave the nicotine replacement therapy there. When we look at varenicline, this medication as well as bupropion, they both have black box warnings. And when, when we look at that black box warning, what we see is that we want to advise people to use nicotine replacement therapy first at the appropriate dose for the appropriate amount of time and also in the appropriate manner. Let's say that people have tried that well. They also need to be informed of the possibility of suicidal thoughts or aggressive thoughts. Now, as I say this, when we look at the research, we don't have the research stating if you do take these medications, that it's, it's caused by taking these said medications. At the same time, we've got to make sure that people are aware of what they need to watch out for and that they have to be comfortable making that decision. So we want to provide people a menu of options. And I will say that we have a number of clients here at our clinic, at the Nicotine Dependence Clinic at the Center for Addiction and Mental Health, who have been diagnosed with depression, who have been diagnosed with uh, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, um, anxiety disorder, and they've used this medication. It has been helpful. But it's important that we have that conversation. Now, when we look at, I'm just going to move the slide forward. When we look at I'm going to talk more specifically about varenicline and bupropion in a little bit because I just want to ch touch on the range area here. And we see that, you know, depending on the person, we want to, to first ask them, you know, would you be comfortable coming back in a week or two weeks? I think this is important to have that discussion and put that out there till we figure out you know, if we're using nicotine replacement therapy, that we have them to a dose, a dose that's effective for them. If we're looking at varenicline or, and bupropion, that they're tolerating the meds well. I could say that as well with the nicotine replacement therapy. So initially, we want people to have more, uh, their follow-ups to be more uh, week, two weeks. In those uh, follow-ups, we also want to ask people about their mood. In tobacco itself, there are uh, there, tobacco has mood elevating qualities. There's beta carbolines in the tobacco that help elevate people's moods. So we want to monitor people for any depressive symptoms. What's going to help us know if this is a possibility is a person's previous quit attempt. So if they got very, very low, this is something that we, we want to watch out for. So if they're on medications for depression, on antidepressants that we look at, okay, maybe they need to have follow-up with their provider and have those uh, medications adjusted. Or maybe they already had uh, propensity to depression, they've never been diagnosed, and these things are coming up now because they've stopped smoking. And we also want to make sure that we can uh, send them to the appropriate person who can help them out. So I just wanted to put that out there that we always want to ask people about their moods. So if we see that there's a partial response, so if I think about nicotine replacement therapy, if I start out at a specific dose, and the person says to me, well, Alex, you know, I'm still having a lot of cravings. Um, it's happening in the late afternoon. And, you know, a couple of cravings are associated when I get home, when I'm working on the computer because I've been smoking by the computer for over 20 years. So hearing that information, because the client is telling me, well, you know, I'm still feeling a lot of uh, cravings. Yes, there's some behavioral ones, but there's other ones that aren't with behavior or emotion or environment. I want to add, I want to augment that dose, make it higher, titrate up. 
And then you can see here if people are doing well, we really want to have that conversation about maintenance. Now, if we go back to the five A's, we know that this is very um, short interactions, five to 15 minutes. And so when we, when we look at who can help the person out? Is there someone in your team who could maybe have a longer conversation with the client? Can you refer that person out for more, um, more help regarding you know, discussion of those environmental, behavioral, and emotional cues to smoking? Is there a group that they could attend? So if you're unable to provide that, uh, kind of counseling aspect, which we know is very helpful when people are using uh, smoking cessation medication, you want to kind of find a place where you can uh, send that person if you're unable to do that. Because we know there's that brain component, but we also know there's that uh, other component in the environment, the behaviors and the emotions. And then here, you're also going to see in terms of the partial response, you want to modify. So you have some example of combination therapies here. So you're looking at combining the patch with the short-acting NRT. And this, this makes a lot of sense because if you think about the patch, it's going to give you a steady dose throughout the day. But what is the person going to use in the morning when it takes about a half an hour, half an hour to an hour for that patch to kick in? Hey, maybe they could use the gum. Maybe they could use the inhaler. What about when they're hanging out with their friends, all of which who are smokers? Yes, they've tried to stay in smoke-free areas, but there may be times where that's not possible. Maybe they could use a short acting at that time, or just those breakthrough cravings. You can see here that bupropion as well as NRT used together, that this can be very helpful because when we look at bupropion, it's how it works is it's not going on, on those uh, nicotine receptors, the alpha-4, alpha-4, beta-2, nicotine, acetylcholine receptors. Um, that bupropion is not going there. What, how bupropion is working is it's, it's, kind of, it's keeping dopamine and neuroepinephrine floating around in the brain longer, and this is how we think it helps people in terms of uh, making that change in their tobacco use. So the additional component of the NRT kind of makes it more powerful. And then you can see here bupropion and vereniclin together. This may be an option for individuals. Um, this may be difficult for people who aren't on uh, ODSP or OW and have to pay for the medications because vereniclin is quite expensive. And you can see here no vereniclin with nicotine replacement therapy. And that's because vereniclin are going on those receptors, um, the alpha-4, beta-2 nicotine, acetylcholine receptors. And so oftentimes people um, may feel additional side effects if they're using NRT. That being said, there may be, and this is sort of, I'll just throw it out for people to consider, you know, maybe a short acting could be helpful. Um, if people, you know, it's going to take about two weeks for the medication to kick in, that's a you know, possibility, or sometimes people may be smoking a little bit um, while they're using the vereniclin, and it could be a safer form of, of nicotine. At the same time, this is off-label use, and uh, if you, you know, would you would have to be pretty comfortable doing that, and you can uh, send me some more questions about that if, if you wish. So 99.9% .9 of the time, people are, are using vereniclin without nicotine replacement therapy. Okay, so before I, I, I get into the new issues with Champix, I just wanted to get back to uh, Champix itself, and, and kind of the, the, so I talked about that idea of, of we want to communicate to people that they need to watch out for possible side effects. We, we know that uh, through the research we don't have uh, 
anything c coming out saying, hey, you know, if you take Champex, for sure uh, you're going to have suicidal or aggressive thoughts. But people have to be aware and make informed choices so they feel comfortable taking this medication, the cost-benefit analysis. Kind of the classic side effects with Champex are nausea, so you want to make sure that people have a big, uh, have a meal, so their stomach is full and a big glass of water when they're taking Vreniclin. Then you've got abnormal dreams, insomnia, and maybe some flatulence. Those are kind of the, the other side effects, nausea being, being the first one. When we look at the FDA, they've, they've now um, issued a new warning in terms of alcohol use with Champex. And with this, we see that there are, have been some cases with a decreased tolerance to alcohol. So the FDA had looked at um, people being prescribed Champex or Vereniclin from 2006 to this point now. So from 2006 to this point now, there have been 48 cases of decreased alcohol tolerance. So what that is meaning is that people are, are feeling more drunk when, you know, if they are drinking. And the other thing being that um, there was a very small amount of people who had talked about not remembering when they had consumed alcohol. And then you can see also here, out of those uh, 48 cases, there were 37 cases of aggressive behavior. The other thing to look at here is we see there were 64 cases of seizures in clients who had been prescribed Champix. And out of those 58, out of those 64 cases, sorry, 27 cases could have been attributed to other factors. So other medications that clients were taking that were lowering the seizure threshold. So as you can see at the bottom, the reference, please uh, have a look at, at this information. Um, very easy to access online. So where does that leave us in terms of this whole idea of alcohol and, and Champex together? So we want to advise clients to re reduce their amount of alcohol when they're uh, being prescribed Vreniclin until they figure out, well, how is this affecting me? You know, I can think about um, oftentimes telling clients to watch out if they're using any heavy machinery when they when they're prescribed Vreniclin, just to make sure to see if they, you know, are feeling um, pretty alert on it. So this is sort of another caution here in terms of letting people know to really watch their alcohol use when they're when they're using Vreniclin. Another thing is we want to do that cost benefit analysis before we prescribe uh, Vreniclin in terms of, you know, if people are, have a history of seizures or they're taking other medications, that can lower that uh, seizure threshold. Also, the other thing we want to look at is, you know, if people do have a seizure, that they get immediate treatment for that occurrence. And then, of course, if they're developing agitation, hostility, aggressive behavior, low mood, or anything out of the ordinary in terms of their personality, they want to go to the nearest ER and, and follow up with you and stop taking the medication. We also want to encourage clients to read the medication guide and maybe even over, go over that uh, guide with the client. I mean, sometimes people may not, you know, their comprehension, may not be there, or English may be a second language. So that might be a good idea to kind of highlight some important things in that to product monograph. And of course, we want to report any adverse events. So then we can also look at, there was a recent study of Vreniclin's effects on uh, reducing smoking. So. What I wanted to say is there was uh, 1,510 
participants. There, there were 61 centers in 10 countries where this study occurred. The study was a randomized, placebo-controlled, double-blind clinical study. And both groups received counseling. And so what we can see is that when people, you know, we see the population here with cigarette smokers not willing or able to quit within the next month, but we're willing to reduce and make a quit attempt within the next three months. So what we can see is the abstinence rates were higher between 15 and 24 weeks in the varenicline group and also higher in the weeks 21 to 52 in the varenicline group. So, so this could be a, a, another option if people are, are sort of not, um, they're considering reducing towards a quit that this can be a, a helpful medication. So before I get to questions, I just wanted to, sorry, I'm just going to uh, move the slide forward. I just want to talk about uh, bupropion a little bit. Um, when we look at, um, if we go back to varenicline, really, not really any contraindications. If someone was very, very depressed and they were having thoughts of ending their life, wouldn't be a good idea to prescribe uh, varenicline. You also want to look at uh, creatinine clearance in the older population because it, it does get metabolized uh, through the kidneys. So pretty much uh, we want to make sure that the kidneys are functioning as they should. If we look at bupropion, there's a number of contraindications that we need to look at. If people have a history of a seizure disorder, we wouldn't want to prescribe that medication. If people have an active eating disorder, we wouldn't want to prescribe that medication because uh, a, a person's electrolytes would be out of balance and that could put them at risk of seizure. We wouldn't want to prescribe that medication if people are on a monoamino oxidase inhibitor uh, type of antidepressant. Um, I haven't seen anybody uh, on that type of medication because there's a lot of cardio, um, cardio effects or heart effects, and there's a lot of food uh, restrictions with that medication. So people cannot be using uh, a monoamino oxidase inhibitor if they're being prescribed bupropion. And if people are already taking bupropion, we wouldn't want to prescribe bupropion on top of that. There might be a caution with people who have been diagnosed with bipolar disorder if there's not a mood stabilizer on board. When we're looking at nicotine replacement therapy, this could be added to um, help added to the bupropion, and you want to kind of titrate to effect. Big side effects with bupropion is. Um, We've got dry, dry eyes, dry mouth, uh, insomnia, and we also want to let people be aware to watch out if they have any rashes. If this occurs, we want them to stop that immediate, immediately, and that could happen in the uh, first week or so that that may happen. We also want to caution as I mentioned before, with the caffeine use, we always want to you know, advise people to watch their caffeine take. But if you think about bupropion, it's a stimulating uh, antidepressant. So if people are you know, receiving a med that's a bit stimulating, and then they have, uh, they're drinking a lot of caffeine, coffees, Coca-Cola, they're going to feel unwell and really jittery. So we want to advise people to slowly cut down on their um, use of, of, of coffee. There are some medications that may need to be adjusted when people are quitting smoking, and that's once again because of that tar in the cigarette smoke that's acting on a liver enzyme, a liver enzyme that metabolizes um, clozapine, haloperidol, chlorpromazine, 
olanzapine. And there is a list of uh, medications that I could send out to individuals that can be affected when people um, stop smoking. So those medications I mentioned, you need more when you're smoking. And so you want to reduce or have, there might be a, a need to reduce those medications when uh, someone uh, stops smoking. The, the last thing I'll say is the, when we talk about medications and, and working with our clients, we always want to provide that menu of options and we want to keep an open conversation and we want to work where the person is at. So um, I think it's important to answer the questions that clients may have and help them feel comfortable in terms of of kind of picking a medication that they feel would help them out. And there's always that opportunity to make that change if, if necessary. I'm just going to think for about 10 seconds here if I've forgotten to tell. Oh, yes, the last thing I wanted to say is when people are, have been diagnosed with diabetes and they take insulin, we want them to monitor their blood sugars more frequently because insulin um, is affected um, when people are smoking. Okay, so what I'm going to do now, we're at uh, 12.45, and so I may ask Tanya to come in here to help me, or I probably will. Tanya, could you come in here just to make sure that I've got these questions yeah. Okay, so. Yeah. Okay, here we go. So it's the tar with NRT won't have the same caffeine sensitivity. So basically, it's when we look at yeah. Absolutely right there. So when I'm, when I'm smoking, that cigarette smoke will act on a liver enzyme, the cytochrome P450. And then there, I think then it's even more specific with uh, 1A2. So that enzyme basically will uh, metabolize the caffeine. And so when I'm smoking, I can really drink way more caffeine because it's getting out of my body faster. And when I stop smoking, it's going to hit me twice as hard because now that cigarette smoke is no longer acting on that liver enzyme, so that tar is not affecting that uh, liver enzyme, and it normalizes, and that five cup of coffee would feel like 10, and I'll feel totally unwell. And then, as I said earlier, earlier you want to, we want people to slowly cut back because if they just get rid of those five coffees a day, they're going to have huge headaches and not feel that great. Okay. Uh, what do you say when patients complain about every option, i.e. taste gross yucky? So that's a great question. So what I often do is I, I kind of use this idea of eliciting information and providing information. So I might say, Okay, because people would come and see me about nicotine replacement therapy because they're interested in that, I would say, so tell me what you know about the NRT or tell me about your experience about that. And so sometimes I've heard people say, oh, yeah, that nicotine gum is really gross. It's disgusting. And I'll say, oh, so could you tell me when's the last time you used nicotine gum? Oh, it was about 15 years ago. Oh, well, you know, there's a number of flavors right now. You know, there's mint, there's cinnamon. I think there's a cooling ice one. <laughs> um, what do you think about that? And so then I'm having a conversation where I'm kind of eliciting from the client what they know about the medication. So let's say because we're part of the STOP study here, I've only got the mint gums. I might say, okay, so, you know, for you, we've discussed the mint gum, and you're like, you don't even want to go there. How about the, the inhaler, or how about 
the lozenge. What do you know about that? So that way, there's, I'm, not, I'm avoiding the yeah buts. I'm going to hear what the person's experience is and what they want and then have a conversation there. Okay. Okay, I must I mean, that's interesting, that comment about how cigarettes taste. And, and, and I think about for a lot of people, they really only enjoy their flavor and it, or like kind of the type of cigarette that they buy. And sometimes we'll ask people how they'd feel about changing their brand if they're interested in reducing it. I thought I'd just throw that out there. So I just wanted to let people know that if you are on the phone right now, that you could press star 1 to ask your question as well. Okay. Okay, so I'm still looking for questions here. Sorry. Okay. Bonnie, do you always use a formal tool, or do you casually ask about mood? Any advice? Oops. Any advice on how to approach this in a setting where training using tools for assessing depression is limited? Okay, excellent question. So um, I do both. So we use something called the PHQ-9, and this is something that people can use that's free of charge. And I believe you can uh, access, uh, access that on the internet. If not, please. Um, Email us here, and I'll 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 put in a, a copy as an attachment. The Beck Depression Scale is something that you would need to pay for, and then sometimes people have used the PHQ two as well. And if they if they kind of if people answer those questions in a way that indicates depression, like a low mood, not having pleasure in doing things, that they would be further assessed with the PH, uh, PHQ-9. When I think about asking about questions specifically about depression, I, I ask about, you know, are you still hanging out with friends or family members? So are you isolating yourself? How's your sleep? Are you sleeping all day long, sleeping a lot of hours, or hardly sleeping? Are you eating, or are you overeating? Are you having a lot of negative thoughts about yourself? Is it really hard for you to uh, get out and do the things you need to do or even to attend to your activities of daily living? And then are you having negative thoughts about yourself? And then you also kind of want to look at what the person looks like. So if I came in, like people can see me on the screen now as I am today, but I come in and my affect is just like, or my eyes are tearful, or my you see like I'm wearing crumpled clothing, or like I'm I'm like looks like I haven't washed my clothes in many days, or my hair is unwashed and I look very unkept. My my the way I talk is very slow. These kinds of things can, can help us, or very quietly I'm talking. So yes, the tool helps you. Definitely, but it doesn't hurt also to um, ask those kind of questions of depression. And when we talk about depression, we're talking about people having this for more than two weeks. Some of these symptoms or most of these symptoms. We know that being sad is a, uh, a withdrawal symptom too. So when we're looking at Depression, we want it for more than two weeks, and, it's, and people are really struggling. And we want to make sure that we, we get them the help that, that's needed. Bupropion and Varenicolin, concern with lowering seizure uh, threshold, recent warning from FDA regarding varenicline. Excellent question. And in light of what I presented at the end, even more so. So I think, once again, if people 
are considering this option that would be much, much further down the line, and would it be safe for that person? What other medications are they taking on top of, you know, if you're prescribing both of these meds together? If I think about um, in the clinic here, I can think of two clients who were prescribed both of these meds at the same time, but they were very healthy individuals in terms of not a, um, uh, not a lot of core morbid uh, issues going on. No, uh, no psychiatric medications that uh, lowered the th uh, seizure threshold. So thank you very much uh, for bringing that forward. It's really important um, that we highlight that. Previous advice was to stop Tambex after one, most, one month of still smoking. The results from the new study suggest, yeah. So if I think about, um, that's an interesting point because usually people are using Champex for 12 weeks because oftentimes the people need to get uh, enough of that medication inside them. And then if we think about, okay, we've got something occupying those receptors now, but there's also people, places, and things that are affecting someone's reasons to smoke. So if, if I've been smoking for 50 years, and every time I get angry or every time I, um, I'm waiting for appointments or getting on the transit, sure, that, that medication is going to help me, right? But there's going to be times where maybe it's going to be hard for me to say no because it's so programmed in my mind. So, you know, that 12 weeks, um, is very helpful. And then there were some studies a while back that talked about for some people even 24 weeks could, could be prescribed. So I, I think it's, we always want to look at the other components that could drive the smoking as well because I've seen a lot of people here at the clinic, maybe they're smoking like three, four cigarettes and it's talking about, you know, what are those cigarettes about? And sometimes it's about, hey, like, I don't know if I can say goodbye forever. And so having those, that's where the counseling piece is really important. Do you have any resources to share that show the amount of tip uh, amount of nicotine typically absorbed from cigarettes. So I can check that out for people in terms of like a, uh, an official document that talks about, you know, people can receive up to one to three milligrams of nicotine depending on how efficient they are. So if I go out and have a cigarette and I smoke that cigarette from beginning to end, I'm going to get more nicotine than someone who has a couple drags here and there and lets it burn in the ashtray. But at the same time, I can see why people may want to have something that's uh, more specific. So I can, I can get that information to you. And also that idea of how um, people don't get this, uh, a full amount from the nicotine pack as well compared to uh, when they're smoking. You can, if you look at the product, monitor that, you can see that there's actually a difference. We can't hear you right now. I'm not able to hear you now. Something's happened with your speaker. Do people hear me? No, I can't hear you. Can people hear me? I can now. OK. Did you have a question? Yes, I do have a question. Uh, actually, two of them. The one was the uh, drugs you said were clonazepam, chlorpromazine, no, alanzapine. The, the drugs are clozapine. Clozapine, OK. Olanzapine, uh, okay. yes. chloropromazine, and haloperidol. Yes. And haloperidol, OK. And, and, and then, like I said, I can send out to people. There, I do have a list of medications that are, that are affected when um, when people quit smoking, that they may need those doses adjusted, so I can send that out as well. 
I can't get on um, for the slides because I can't use the more advanced uh, flash player. And so I was wondering if the slides could be emailed to me. Could uh, slides be emailed to people who do not have an uh, updated or fast enough system for the slides? I'm going to actually pass you to, actually, can you, can you email Tanya with that request? Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. Thanks. Okay. Okay. So the next question I'm going to look at is um, to continue with treatment for, okay, Claudia, to continue treatment for, oh, the results are yeah, and I think I addressed that, that people can't, yes. Okay. I'm sorry, everybody. I'm hoping you can hear me well now. Um, so I think I spoke to how people can use Champex up to 24 weeks. And I think the barrier there is the cost because it, it can be quite expensive to take that medication. So I'll, I'll throw that 